Thank you for being part of the Oakwood Free Will Baptist Church Ministries. Our prayer is that those who listen to the Word of God will find a greater revelation of God's purpose in their lives. For additional resources, please visit us on the web at www.oakwoodfwb.com. Today, may you be encouraged, strengthened, and refreshed by our message. To be in prayer for Jimmy and Debbie, too. I have been, yes. Um, and a matter of fact, I've been in contact with them. Uh, Jimmy is having a very difficult time with his dad and the things of that nature. And so uh, we definitely want to keep him in, in our prayers. Uh, if you have your Bibles this morning, uh, we're going to be looking at Revelation chapter 1. Now, I know Brother Mike, was it last, well, it wasn't last week, was it? It was the week before, uh, where you guys talked about some of the end time stuff. Uh, but Revelation chapter 1, I'm going to read verses 7 through 11. And we're going to be asking you some questions, okay? Um, asking some questions about this particular passage, and then we're going to try to draw some truths out about the coming of Christ, okay? Uh, Revelation chapter 1, verse 7. Behold, he is coming with clouds, and every eye will see him. Even they who pierced him, and all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him. Even so, amen. Verse 8. I am the Alpha and the Omega. The beginning and the end, says the Lord, who is, who was, and who is to come, the Almighty. Verse 9. I, John, both your brother and companion in the tribulation and kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, was on the island that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day and heard him, or I'm sorry, and heard behind me a loud voice as of a trumpet saying, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last. And what you see, write in a book and send it to the seven churches which are in Asia, to Ephesus, Smyrna, to Pergamos, to Thyatira, to Sardis, to Philadelphia, and to Laodicea. <clears throat> now, when we think about this passage, there's some questions I want to ask you this morning. Some of them can be answered simply by listening to what I just read or by reading what you just read. Who is the author of this book? Who is it that wrote the book of Revelation? John. John, all right? John um, wrote the book of Revelation. What was the setting? I mean, where was John at when he wrote the book? Heaven. Okay. Before the throne. Well, he saw a vision right. before the throne. But the actual writing of this, he was on the Isle of Patmos. Now, basically, he was exiled. He was thrown in, onto this island with, you know, basically he's by himself, there's nobody else there, he is in exile. And so he, he sees a vision from God. Obviously we know that when you look beginning in Genesis all the way to the book of Revelation, um, the scripture teaches that itself, that it is inspired of God, that it is God breathed. That's literally translating it the way that it says, it is God breathed, that is the spirit of God inspired these men to write the word of God. The idea, uh, the idea that you get is like this. Picture an, a sailboat that is on the ocean. And whatever way the wind blows, now I know that you can steer the sailboat here and there depending on where you put the, you know, the uh, sail. But the idea here is that it was the Spirit of God that led them, that is, that pushed them, that like the wind blows a sailboat, that the word that God pushed them or God breathed this message through them so that we have the accurate Word of God today. Now, I know that when we think about inspiration, think about the inspired, infallible, inerrant Word of God. When we think about the infallibility and the inerrancy and all those things, we need to understand that the infallibility and the inerrancy pertains to the original manuscripts, okay? Uh, today, we have translations. Now, those translations are only as good as, as they are close to the original manuscripts. That's why if I ever have a question, hey, John 6, 37, well, I'm going to read that to you. Uh, and I'm, I'm kind of running a rabbit trail here, but I feel like this is where we need to go. Um, John 6, I think it's John 6, 37. Let's see if I can find it. Um, yes, that's it, John 6, 37. Here's what it says in the King James. All the Father giveth me shall come to me, and him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. Now, when you read it this way, 
and you say, you say, all the Father gives to me will come to me. People can take that and they can translate it into saying, oh, God arbitrarily chooses some to be saved and some not to be saved. Because it says, all the Father gives to me will come to me. So when you read that translation, you think, oh, well, yeah, that kind of backs up what the Calvinists would say. I'm moving around, Miss Tammy. I'm sorry. I'm, I need to stand back where the camera can pick me up. Um, you know, people will say, well, there it is right there. That tells me that God picks and chooses who's going to be saved. Because it says, all the Father gives to me, this is Christ talking, is going to come to me. All right? Well, if you look back in the original Greek, the, uh, the Koine Greek language, which is where we get the New Testament, the translation from, what it really says, if you read back in the original Greek, is all that come to me, the Father gives to me. And him that comes to me, I will in no wise cast out. There's a big difference in that translation, right? Because the one of them, the King James says, all the Father gives to me will come to me. Well, that right there kind of gives you the idea that God picks and chooses some. But in the original language, it's translated, all who come to me, the Father gives to me. That is, hey, God didn't pick and choose. God wants everybody to be saved. He gives everyone an opportunity to come to Christ. Okay? So when I say that, inspiration only is valid in the original manuscripts. Okay? So when we think, by the way, I believe we have an inspired word of God today. Okay? Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that the King James Version is not expired. Not inspired. I said expired. Not inspired. I believe it is. But we've got to be careful when there are certain verses that they are translated this way, but they're better translated this way, you've got to look back at the original language. That's always should be the case, okay? Uh, if there's ever a question, well, did God mean this? You go back to the Greek. By the way, I have a, a Greek New Testament, which is pretty cool, because when you look into the Greek, I'm giving you a Greek lesson this morning, when you look into the Greek language, like you and I would say, I am going to church today. Well, in the original Greek language, it says, to the church, I am going today. So it's kind of, it, it says things differently, okay? So when you, when you read it, you've got to take that into account as well. Uh, the Greek language is probably the most comprehensive and hard to understand language of any language in the world. Um, for instance, there is, when you conjugate one verb, the word um, luo, which means I lose or I destroy, when you translate that one verb, it can be translated a hundred different ways. So it's a very comprehensive language. So, you know, when, when I was in college, we had to translate, uh, or we had to be able to, to name all of the different tenses of the verb luo. So like in our exam, we had to be able to say, luo, luai, suai, luo, luo, luete, luo, se, luo, somai, luo, se, luo, se, luo, se, luo, se, luo, se, I mean, it goes on and on. There's a hundred different words for that one word, okay? And so each word means something different. You know, it stresses something different. And so, anyway, um, I felt like I was speaking in tongues right there, but I was not trying to do that. Uh, I was just telling you, there's a lot of different ways that you can translate a verb, all right? And so, so when we think about this particular setting, the Holy Spirit of God directs John on the Isle of Patmos to pen these words. And notice what he said. He said, I'm going to show you what is now, and then what is to come. So he's giving us prophecy in this book. Some of the things have already happened. Some of them are happening now. But let me show you what's going to happen down the road. And so this is a prophetic book, the book of Revelation. Now, it talks about, he says, Behold, he comes in the clouds, verse 7. Every eye will see him, even they who pierced him. And all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him. Now, this is referring to the second coming. There's something else that's happened before this happens. Before the actual second coming of Christ, there's something else that's got to happen first. Rapture. That's the rapture of the church. Okay? So here you've got in the timeline, the rapture of the church literally ushers in the day of the Lord. When you hear the phrase, the day of the Lord, uh, in the Bible, it's talking about that time beginning with the rapture of the church all the way through the millennial reign of Christ and then I guess all throughout eternity because from that point it is the day of the Lord. So the first thing that's got to happen is the Lord's church has got to be raptured out. Okay. Now there are people that will believe today that 
oh, well, the rapture is going to take place in the middle of the tribulation period or at the end of the tribulation. That's called mid-trib and post-trib. Obviously, we teach and believe that it is pre-trib. That is, we will be ushered out of here as believers before the tribulation will begin. Now, I think and honestly, I believe that that is consistent more with the scripture than any other of those beliefs. Okay, uh, If God told us, pray that you will escape judgment, why would he say pray if there was no way you're going to escape judgment? I'm talking about the tribulation period. Okay, So I believe, according to the scripture, that this has got to take place first. In order for the Antichrist to be revealed, the Antichrist will be revealed prior to the tribulation beginning. So in order, or at least right at the beginning of that. So in order for the Antichrist to be revealed, those who are Christians have got to be taken out of the way first. That's what the Bible tells us. He who hinders has got to be taken out of the way. It refers to the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God lives in every believer. So, right, and he can't remove the Spirit without taking us. That is correct. Because he promised us yes. that the Spirit would be with us always. Absolutely. So it's it's got to be that way. In other words, now by the way, let me tell you this. The Bible says that no one can be saved unless the, unless the Spirit draws them. So you say, well, Brother Wayne, didn't you tell us a while back that people during the tribulation period, some of them will be saved? Yes, they will. Well, <coughs> how are they going to be saved unless the Spirit draws them? Because the Spirit's only gone for a short time. That's it. The Spirit of God, yes. Hey. Okay, so if the rapture happens first, all the Christians are taken away. Yes. If we're seeing the tribulation stuff, we haven't been taken away. Well, um, you'll know the rapture happens because we'll, half the world's going to be gone. Right. Okay. They're the ones that are saved like that. Right. The rest of us still got to work at it. No, you'll be gone with them. No, no. Here's the thing. Here's the thing, Abe. What say, if I'm seeing this stuff happening, then I didn't make it. Yeah. <laughs> right, exactly. That's it. Yes. Yeah. And, and to be honest with you, you know, there, there are people, um, and I, I, I'm careful how I say this because... The ones who only have head knowledge. That's it. There are people that have it here, but they never had it here. Right. Okay? I mean, the Christian life is not just simply knowing there is a God and knowing that Jesus is who he said he was. It has to be a, a, a lifestyle. You have to say... I take Jesus and him alone, and he's the one that I'm living for. And, you know, and I'm not just believing in my head. I believe with my heart, and I've given him my life. You know, I am a Christian. I am a follower of Christ. There are people who believe there's a God and who believe that Christ is who he, who he said he was, but that doesn't mean that they've accepted him into their heart, okay, into their life. I say heart, I mean life. Um, and so the Bible says, by their fruit you will know them. You see, if you've got someone who professes to be a Christian, but their life is not changed, then there's a problem there. I mean, there ought to be some definite signs that a person has been truly saved, okay? I mean, you may not be perfect, and I may not be perfect, but there ought to be some telltale signs that, hey, God's made a change in that person's life because they came to know Christ, okay? And so, but everyone who truly is a believer will be taken out of the way. I mean, they will be snatched up. First, matter of fact, I'm preaching on 1 Thessalonians 4 today, uh, right after uh, our class. I'll be preaching that for the main message. It says this, um, The Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, the voice of the archangel, the trump of God, the dead in Christ will rise first. Okay? Now, we know that when we die, our body's put in the grave. But our spirit automatically goes to be with the Lord. If you are a Christian, immediately... If you, let's say that, God forbid, but let's say that you, you, you drive down the road today in your hot rod and somebody hits you head on and you die instantly. Immediately, because you know the Lord is your Savior, immediately your spirit goes to be with Him. Your body's put in a grave. All right? One day, when that trump sounds and Christ is coming back for His church, before we ever go, those of us who are still alive, before we ever go, the dead in Christ, that is, those bodies that are in the grave even though how decayed they may be, they're going to rise up and they're going to meet that spirit in the clouds. They're going to, God's going to bring that spirit and that body back together. He's going to remake that body into a perfect body. All right? 
And I then it says, I lose my sense of smell. <laughs> and then it says, we that are alive and remain, that is, those of us who are still here that have not died in the Lord yet, we're going to be taken up immediately and we're going to meet them in the clouds. And the Bible says, so shall we ever be with the Lord. Now, I don't know about you. When I picture that scene, man, I get chills. Can because, you imagine being a non-Christian living next door to a cemetery? Yeah, the but, graves going and bodies coming out of the grave. Um, yes. What have you been cremated? It doesn't matter. Listen, here's the thing, Abe. God took Adam from the dust of the ground and made him. God knows where every dust particle that you're, if you take your ashes and you scatter them around, around the ocean, God knows where they're at. God can bring those things back together. If he made Adam from the dust of the ground, he can make your body back again. Now, I'm not an advocate of cremation. I'm not saying it's a sin, but I, I want my body intact. <laughs> but I mean, you think about people like that have been burned. You know, you think about explosions, people in the military that are believers, their bodies just completely gone because of explosions or whatever. I mean, no matter what the situation is, God can bring all that stuff back together, okay? Uh, so, anyway. So, is, is there nothing wrong with being cremated? I, I will not personally. I will not personally do it, but I'm not saying there's anything wrong with okay. it, okay? Uh, I cannot tell you that it's a sin, okay? The reason I, I say that is because to me, being put into the ground That's can make somebody feel obligated to stay close. And sure. I don't want to do that because I've been all over the world. I don't want to tie her down to say, well, I got to stay here because this is where he's Sure. Here. Right. Okay. If she wants he won't to. be there anymore. I know. Why am I going to pay for a, a, a plot that nobody's ever going to come by and see when all she's got to do is close her eyes and talk to me? I sure. can always go visit you when I go visit him at home. <laughs> <laughs> For a small fee. Yeah, for a small. <laughs> I didn't think of that. Oh, uh, well, you know, and the thing is, and you're right. I mean, when when you said whoever it was that said we're not there, I mean, we're not. I mean, our body's there, but who we are is not there anymore. I mean, we're with the Lord. To be absent from the body, the Bible says, is to be present with the Lord. So you're the real who you are inside of you is not there anymore. Okay, but it's interesting that God one day is going to take that body and reunite. Now, when we, when our body and spirit are reunited at the rapture of the church, then according to what the Bible tells us, it will be an eternal glorified body. It's kind of like the body that Christ was in when he was resurrected. Remember he told Mary, don't touch me. Remember, remember when he said that? Uh, because he said, I've not yet ascended to my father. It was a glorified body. It's going to be a perfect body. Now, I've never had a perfect body and I don't know what that's like, but I'm looking forward to no more sickness, no more ailments. My knees right now are just about done in, done for. That's right. You're gonna have some, you're gonna have some six pack of abs or whatever it is. Um, so yeah, whatever a perfect body is, that's what we're gonna have. Uh, and so that I'm really looking forward to. So uh, anyway, all right. I tell you what, y'all got me running a rabbit trail this morning. Um, okay. So the author of the book was John. It was written on the Isle of Patmos. And by the time of the writing, uh, this apostle was known as the beloved disciple. Uh, he's in his 90s when he got the vision from God and, and when he wrote this passage. He's been exiled into a basically a barren chunk of rock out in the middle of the Mediterranean. And um, anyway, if you think about it, it would have been, you could say it would have been the Alcatraz of his day. It's kind of like out in the middle of nowhere. It's out in the middle of this island. And he's there by himself. And um, so, anyway, when John, from John getting his, I'm sorry, from whom is John getting his instructions? Look at verses 10 and 11. Verses 10 and 11. What does it say? I was in the Spirit of the Lord's day and heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet, saying, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last. And what thou seest, write in the book, and send it unto the seven churches which are in Asia, and to Ephesia, and unto Smyrna, and unto Pergamos, and unto Thyatria, and unto mm. Sardis, and unto Philadelphia, and unto La Laodicea. Okay, so he gets his instructions, he gets his inspiration, he gets his message from the Alpha and the Omega. 
Well, who is the Alpha and Omega? God. It's God. God gives John the very words that he's pinning down. All right? So the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, that is God, uh, is who is speaking uh, to John. He said in verse 12, Then I turned to see the voice that spoke with me, and having turned, I saw the seven golden lampstands, and in the midst of the seven lampstands, one like the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to his feet, and girded about with a chest with a golden band. Uh, when Jesus, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to fast forward a little bit. When Jesus returns, who is it that's going to see him? Now, this is not the rapture, because nobody sees him during the rapture. I mean, he's going to be in the clouds, and he's going to, the trumpet's going to blow, and we're going to meet him. Those of us who are still here, and those bodies are in the grave, all of them are going to be come up, and we're going to have a great reunion in heaven together in the clouds. So not every eye will see him then. Only those who know Christ, who are raptured up, will see him then. But Everybody the second coming, every, it says every eye will see, every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that he is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And here's, here's the thing. Can anybody tell me? I mean, this is kind of trivia this morning. Can anybody tell me where he's going to step down at? Where is, when Christ comes down for the second coming, where is he going to step down? In Israel. Yes. Tim. Mount Calvary. All right. Uh, you're close. The Mount of Olives. Yeah. The Mount of Olives. And when his feet hits the Mount of Olives, there's going to be a rift from east to west. The whole earth is going to be split right down the middle. Are you talking about, you ever, you ever see Superman? All right. You ever, the, the new Superman that came out, you, ever, you see that? Let me tell you, this is pretty awesome because I, I just pictured this and, and maybe I'm reading a little too much into it. But you know how he's, he's trying to fly for the first time and he finally gets it and he reaches down, he puts that fist down and all of a sudden the elements start rising up from the ground and then whew, he flies on up into the air. But when he lands sometimes, it's like, boom, and then everything just, whoosh, you know. Anyway, sorry, I'm, I'm giving my, uh, my little sound bits here. But this is the way I picture Christ coming down, his feet hits the Mount of Olives and it's just like, boom, and then there's a great rift ripping from east to west. Um, that's pretty awesome. I and, think it'll be awesome to see every knee bow. Oh yeah. Including Satan. Well, and if you think about this, you know, years ago, see people have always talked about, man, Christ is coming soon. Matter of fact, all the way back to AD 48, people were prophesying, the Lord's coming soon, the Lord's coming soon. You fast forward all the way to 1988, there's a guy that wrote a book, 88 Reasons Why Jesus is Coming Back in 88. And then he, he said, well, I missed the date. So he wrote a book, 89 Reasons Why Christ is Coming Back in 89. Now that is just ridiculous for somebody to pinpoint a day. But the Bible says by the signs and times, you're going to know that this is soon. And as we look around us today, we know it's got to be soon. And so when we think about this, every eye will see him. Think about even 50 years ago, 40 years ago. Um, there was something that we did not have that we have today. Can anybody tell me what it is? Internet. 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 So years ago... But I don't ago, think it's going to be the internet that causes people to see him. No, 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 no. What I'm saying is, well, there are going to be a lot of folks that see him, but I'm just saying, when, when you think about people in other countries, I mean, when he comes and sets his foot down the Mount of Olives, I mean, a person in India cannot see the Mount of Olives, <coughs> is what I'm saying. There will be a lot of folks that will see him simply because we've got technology today that we did not have back then. It's televised. And you don't think we'll all be gathered? The remaining population will, won't be gathered there? Well, see, I think that... I don't, I don't know that that's the case, Miss Dixie. Because then he starts the judgment. Right. Those people got to be there to be judged. Sure. Well, you know, I, I tend... And it may be that way, but I tend to believe that it has to be it has to do with the technology and the fact that everybody around the world can see it happening. See, I think the technology is there to spread the word of God. Right. Now nobody can say they've never heard of Christ. Sure. Sure. Because it's the out there everywhere. Yes. There are billions of people that can say that. The farmers in China, the, you know, there are a whole lot of people that are away from technology. Yeah, but well, I've never seen the internet or television right. or anything like that. In sure. China, it's the word of mouth that's going around. Yeah, but you also have to try to see the Amazon that sure. nobody ever came across. 
Oh, well. Well, but here's the thing. The Bible does say this, that in, in order for, for Christ to come back, every, in other words, every tongue, every tribe will hear or have a chance to hear about and that's the where the 144,000 witnesses come in too, because they that's go around it. the world. Sure. Yeah. So to every tribe in every nation, every kindred and every tongue, it talks about. Yes. So, yep. Yeah. All right, we got to finish because the bell just rang. So, let's pray. Father, once again, we thank you for the opportunity to to talk about the Word of God this morning. We thank you for um, how that you have blessed us to be able to be together as your family. Uh, Lord, I thank you for my brothers and sisters this morning and thank you for uh, their input and their thoughts about these particular things. And Lord, I pray that you would again today draw us to yourself. I pray that, um, that everything that is said and done, not just in this hour, but in the worship hour, would bring honor and glory to you. God, you're the only one that's worthy to be worshipped. Uh, Lord, we are simply your children. We are simply those who, uh, who count on you. Uh, Lord, to, to minister, to meet the needs in our lives. And, and Lord, we thank you that because of Christ, we have the hope of heaven. Lord, I pray for those who have yet to receive Christ. Lord, I pray that you would uh, draw them to yourself, those who may be here today that do not know the Lord, that you would help them, that it would be this day that they would trust you as their Savior. And God, I know that we've got, some of us have got a lot of questions about different things. But Lord, Lord ultimately, uh, if you were able to be understood completely, you would not be God. Uh, we are not infinite beings. God, you are. And uh, Lord, we don't know everything, but you do. And Father, I pray that those things that we don't understand, that we would simply receive and accept them uh, by faith. God, one day we will understand because we'll see you face to face. But until that day happens, I pray that you would uh, increase our faith and Lord, uh, help us to trust you in everything. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.